Good afternoon, and welcome to the third program of the World Affairs Council of Western Michigan's 2020 eight-week Great Decision Series, with topics suggested by the Foreign Policy Association of America. I'm Christy Potter. I'm the director of the January series at Calvin University. And on behalf of President Leroy and the faculty and staff and students at Calvin, we thank you for your attendance. Welcome to our ac academic home, and I hope that you return for a visit to Calvin soon. We also welcome our live stream audience across the state today, noting that uh, participation, the pr participation of Northern Michigan University in Marquette. We are pleased to host the Great Decision Series here at Calvin because the series fits seamlessly with the university's mission and that of the January series that we just recently completed. Calvin University equips students to think deeply, to act justly, and to live wholeheartedly as agents, Christ's agents in the world. And for over 30 years, the January series has cultivated deep thought and conversations about important issues of the day in order to inspire cultural renewal and make us better global citizens in God's world. Today, we're honored to welcome Dr. Steve Dazzle of the RAND Corporation. After Dr. Dazzle's presentation this afternoon, there will be ample time for questions, and we will have microphones ready on either side of the recital hall, and Erica and, and Michael will be nearby for assistance. You may text to the number that will be showing on the screen or use the response cards if you took one when you arrived, and then the questions will be asked for you. Please exhibit civility to our guest and hospitality to others in the auditorium by asking respectful and succinct questions. And now my friend and former colleague, Mr. Michael Vendenen, Executive Director of the World Affairs Council of Western Michigan, will introduce our guest. Thanks, Christy. Thanks to Calvin College. Uh, Calvin University. <laughs> it's going to take me forever to get used to that for being our host. We really appreciate that and uh, their help in live streaming this program. On behalf of my colleagues, Erica Kubik and Emily Smith, we welcome. Uh, the World Affairs Council is uh, pleased to host this series and pleased to do that with our educational partners. Council's mission is to empower the people and organizations of West Michigan to engage thoughtfully with the world. We do that with the help of 50 local businesses and most of our colleges and universities in West Michigan. Together, we seek to provide programming that is credible, that's objective, that's relevant, that's civil, and it's compelling. To change the world, we believe, you first have to know the world. Today, we say thank you to Wolverine Worldwide as our series sponsor, to Arconic as our live stream sponsor, to Blue Lake Radio and the Community Media Center as media sponsors, and to the Calvin University Political Science Department as today's topic sponsor. Steve Dalzell is a senior defense policy researcher for the RAND Corporation in Washington, D.C. His current research focuses on U.S. security assistance in Africa and U.S. Army personnel management and readiness, particularly as they relate to reserve components. He's a retired colonel in the U.S. Army Reserve. He served two tours with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, two years as the Army Reserve's Director, Director of Strategy and Integration, and overseas assignments in Italy, Djibouti, Germany, Honduras, and Korea. He was an Army Fellow at RAND in 2002, and a Senior Service College Fellow at the Fletcher School of Tufts University in 2005-06. That same year, he completed his PhD from the University of California at Santa Barbara. Before joining RAND, he was a professional lecturer at American University School of International Service, where he taught courses on U.S. foreign policy, peace and conflict resolution, African security, and veterans' issues. His presentation today is titled Regional Security in the Red Sea. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Steve Dalzell. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. So it's great to be here. Um, Welcome to everybody here and virtually uh, out there. Um, first thing I have to start with, as you're probably used to in these events, is that now that you've mentioned all the different places I've worked over the years, I have to say that everything I say reflects my own opinions and none of my former or current employers. Um, so yes, I'm paid by the RAND Corporation, but this is largely based on uh, the body of experiences I've had working uh, in other places as well. Um, First thing we have to kick off with is, this is a very complex subject. Uh, the Red Sea is a large region with a lot of different countries and, and complexity, uh, and the topic of security is very complex. 
uh, starting with the region that we talk about, this is what the picture of the Red Sea region would have looked like about 120, 130 years ago. Uh, parts of it were colonized, parts of it remained independent. Uh, this map happens to focus on the African side of the Red Sea area, the Horn of Africa, and you'll see Italian, English, French, German colonies all around the periphery there. Basically, any place that there was a coastline that a European power wanted access to, somebody put their flag down and claimed it. Um, those boundaries, however, have remained largely what they've become today, what we've inherited from them. Uh, north of the strait, not marked on the map, Yemen was divided into parts controlled by the Ottoman Empire, the far southern fringe uh, of, of their, their territory, and part of it was British controlled. So today, we look at it, uh, independent countries. However, one thing that's interesting about this particular part of the world is that it's one place where the boundary lines actually do change. Uh, in most of Africa and Europe, borders have become sacred things, right? Nobody likes to talk about changing boundaries. Here we've had um, Yemen, that was two countries for 30 years, and then after the Cold War, unified, briefly. Uh, we had the country of Sudan that just recently split into two, with South Sudan breaking off after a long period of, of seeking independence. Somalia still looks like one state on the map, but in practice is actually divided up into several different areas with relative autonomy. Somaliland and Puntland in the north that were not Italian colonies during the colonial period and today are treated like semi-independent areas. In the same way, security can mean different things to different people. There's everything, what we'll largely deal with today is international security. That's kind of the theme of the, the topics here. But that's not to diminish the importance of national security, phys physical security of the populations on the ground, or human security, which is kind of a convenient umbrella for do the people in the country have the ability to find food, shelter, education, and all the necessities of life. Those can be treated as separate categories for analysis, but in fact, they all connect to each other. It's hard to have national security or physical security if you haven't met the human security needs of your population. And I don't want my focus on national security interests to, to let us lose sight of that. Um, other maps give us a different picture of the area we're talking about. You can also overlay on these boundaries and borders uh, ethnic groups, religious affiliations. On the, the left, you see the, what you might call greater Somalia, right? The, if you map where the people who identify as Somalis live, the people that speak the language, it goes far beyond the boundaries of what we call Somalia at the UN right? Parts of Ethiopia, parts of Kenya, um, even into a, a section of Djibouti, right? Would, would identify that way. So what does that mean for international relations in the region? Within Yemen, and we'll get, spend a, quite a bit of time talking about this today, um, you've got a section in the north where the, the, the Houthi group comes from that are Shia Muslims, while the rest of the country are in the Sunni branch of Islam. Um, it's, so those kind of divisions have to be accounted for as well. Why do we care about this region? Why, why, why is this worth being a topic within this series? Three main reasons will usually rise to the top of most lists. On the left, we see a map of trade routes that pass through the main straits within the world. And you see that there are a lot of them that pass through this hub right there at the connection between the Indian Ocean, the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf in that area, particularly with oil, one of the major commodities in the world market, as we all know, uh, pass through that area. And so trade is a significant reason why the world cares about security here. The picture at the bottom is, some people might recognize the USS Cole. And so people in the world care about this region because militaries and politicians and other parts of governments have activities and they want their ships and planes and people to be safe when they're out there doing activities within a region. And when you have an area where your forces are threatened, that becomes a national security issue. 
And then finally, on the human security side, is it's a litany of challenges within this region, both in the Yemen side and the Horn of Africa. The picture is from the latest news, right? I think it's three or four days ago, where a literal plague of locusts is passing up East Africa, threatening South Sudan, Kenya, and and probably going further into Ethiopia and Somalia, um, ravaging whole towns just with millions of, of insects coming through and eating everything in sight. What's that going to do for the ability of the people to st- sustain their livelihoods, to maintain their jobs, to support their families? And if they can't do all of that, what does that mean for the international development, right? Who's going to come to their aid, and how is that aid going to get to these people? Who's going to control where the aid goes? All of these are very important questions that link the forms of security together. The approach I'm going to follow is picking just a couple of these issues, a couple historical but current but recent examples and one current example, and talk about them as policy challenges, right? It's very easy to talk, it's, history is complex, but it's relatively easy to talk history. Uh, it's harder to come up with what are the ideas that you have for solving these problems? What are the options that we have, either as governments or as people or societies, to address some of these issues? I'll admit up front, it's only one way to approach this problem. In a perfect world, we'd have a whole panel up here of religious studies, sociologists, anthropologists, economists, and we'd all be sharing perspectives from our particular disciplines about what's going on. Unfortunately, right now for today, you're stuck with me, and I'll try to respect all of those other disciplines, but not uh, pretend to capture all of their their beauty and complexity. Um, So the first one, when you talk about Security and the Red Sea, the obvious connection in most people's minds was probably the problem of Somali pirates. And so if you were following this area 10 years ago, that was probably the peak of the piracy problem, where on any given, in in, in the year of 2011, there were close to 260 different pirate incidents within the Red Sea region. And that ranged from trying to seize the entire ship and take control of the ship and sell it or do something with it, to sealing the products on the ship, or to just taking the people off the ship and holding them hostage and asking for ransom from their employers or the shipping company or the country that they belong to. Uh, In response, um, the world paid something like $6 billion that year in the form of higher insurance rates for shipping companies, military forces deployed to the area, and using private security to try to counteract those pirates. So a very significant issue, and not just uh, a convenient joke about Jack Sparrow being somewhere at loose in the, in the Caribbean, or off away from the Caribbean. So what do we do about that, though? It's a complex problem. It sounds, you know, antique and uh, antiquated as a problem goes, but you have to deal with it somehow. In hindsight, the United States documents will give you five pillars of our counter-piracy strategy. In practice, those evolved over time based on how they could, how quickly they could muster the resources to do them. So it started with a military branch because that's something that governments can always respond pretty quickly with. So within a year after that peak in 2011, uh, something like 22 different countries had had ships working within the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean trying to counteract piracy. 30 ships on the water on any given day out there patrolling. And they were pretty successful, right? They were out there. They could, if they were able to intercept a pirate ship um, in progress or catch up with one after an attack, they could seize it, take the people, hold on to them. Um, But that's only so much. You know, 30 ships in, a, in an area the size of the Indian Ocean and all these other gulfs uh, doesn't give you an immediate response. It doesn't cover every ship that's out there going all different directions. So the second piece that evolved was using the, the ships themselves for their own defense, encouraging the shipping companies to hire private security forces and put them on the, on the ships to defend them against the pirates. And statistically, that seemed to make a very significant difference. Right? Ships that had private security on board were much less likely to be successfully attacked. Pirates just chose to go other directions, as you know, rational actors would. Um, but even that, even combining private security and military security, you're still left with other problems. Right? 
That Navy ship from the United States that grabbed a couple pirates in the act, what are they going to do with those guys? Take them back to New York to put them on trial for piracy? Uh, that's a lot of expense for two guys that probably have, were doing it out of economic necessity and don't have much to, to offer and probably don't even mind the opportunity to stay on a Navy ship for a few months getting around. You want to put them on trial, right? Where are you going to take them? Somalia at that time had no functioning government. Most of the states around that area, bordering the Indian Ocean, didn't have any kind of uh, maritime police force or court system. Often they didn't even have laws against piracy because it wasn't a problem for them. So it took years to develop some institutions within the African partners. Kenya, the Seychelles, developed courts to try pirates. Um, developed holding areas, you know, prisons set aside for that particular population. And even that gets old after a while. So then they want to develop, well, something in Somalia where you can take them back and let them serve their time there, get them, make it a Somali problem again. That's all good. What else happens when you start apprehending all these guys on board the pirates' ships that you catch? Do you think that you catch the bosses? Or you catch the, the poor guy who had nothing better to do and gets, you know, recruited to man a gun or, you know, drive a boat or something like that. That's who you get, the small fish. So then you enlisted Interpol and the rest of the intelligence services to try to track down who the real big players were, where the money was going. How do you crack down on what's really the driving the piracy organizations? Um, so that was the fourth pillar, the network attack. And then finally, underlying all of that is the awareness that People don't choose to be pirates because they think it's a great and glamorous career. They're probably doing it because they've got to feed their families. And so if you want to ultimately eliminate the problem and not just keep enforcing it and minimizing it, you need to do something about development on the ground to undercut the recruiting. And so a big effort was pushed to developing those economic options back on the ground in, in the Somali territories and eliminate that. Together, what you see is... Excuse me. What you see is this. Uh, if you look at the map close to Somalia, the light color is where all the attacks were in 2010, 2011. As the orange gets brighter and fans out, those were where the attacks were taking place in 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015. Right? So what you see is this expansion out away from the Somali coast as it got harder to conduct these at activities inside. What's it look like today? You can find the Red Sea on there, somewhere right in the middle, where there are no pinpricks put down. That's because in 2019, there were no reported pirate incidents within the Red Sea. I don't want to be hauling a ship with valuable cargo around West Africa or through the Straits of Malacca down in Southeast Asia, but if you're there within the area of the Red Sea, um, you're probably in pretty good shape. So problem for now, largely transformed into a problem of enforcement and continued, you know, upkeeping. But we have lessons that can be learned for other parts of the world. All those other places where you see these attacks going on, the idea would be, can you learn some of the lessons from the Red Sea and apply them there to help solve some of their security problems? Remember, we went back, one of the ongoing topics in that first discussion was security in Somalia. So what I'd like to turn to is the second case study looking at the problem of fighting back against al-Shabaab. So al-Shabaab being the most recent form of extremist ideology, um, radical Islam in a certain form uh, that has is, is taken over in Somalia. Um, as late as uh, the early part of the 2000 teens, they were controlling most of Somalia and it took a concerted international effort to turn the tide in that regard. So we're going to walk through that for a couple of minutes. Um, in Somalia, thinking strategically, you see a similar pattern to what you've seen in other parts of the Middle East and Africa and around the world, is that the United States relies on three basic pillars of activity, right? One is we use technology, our maritime forces, our air forces, drones, now that we have those available to us, and apply that technology for selected targeting um, and, and operations that we want to focus on. We also rely on partner nations. 
you know, whatever country we're dealing with, we want to develop the capacity of the people on the ground to provide for their own defense and security. And then third, we use some degree of our own boots on the ground, typically special operations forces or for things like that, to kind of, one, link our technology to the partner nation people, as well as to provide specific other, you know, military capabilities on the ground. Uh, you saw that in Afghanistan, you've seen that, uh, we'll see that a little bit in Yemen as we go forward, and definitely in Somalia. The mixes change depending on what country you have and what your options are. In Somalia, for example, we did very little with airstrikes and drone attacks until the last couple of years. It was not our weapon of choice, right? Uh, likewise, we didn't have a lot of boots on the ground. We didn't have forces in Somalia. It was just often too dangerous to, to have people there doing, uh, serving as U.S. military forces there. So what we really relied on was those partner nations. And so to walk through that, I'm going to take a step back for a second and describe a little bit of the African security situation, because that's very important to understanding how this eventually played out is after Rwanda and after the first rounds of violence in Somalia, the African Union decided that something had to change. And they have, uh, took basically a, a two-path approach towards security. One was the long term of trying to actually give African solutions to African problems. And what that, part of what that means is, instead of calling on outsiders to come in and do peacekeeping operations, as it happened since the 1960s, they said Africans need to step up and be our own peacekeepers. And so in each of the five regions of Africa, they started creating standby forces that eventually, in theory, would be able to go in and stop a genocide or stop a civil war if needed. Um, that's a long-term effort, though. That's going to take a lot of time teaching those armies to work together out in the field and to conduct you know, effective military operations. Before they could really do that effectively, Somalia rose up again, and they had to do something about that in the, in the immediate term. And so the AU, the African Union, and the UN combined to create something called the African Union Mission in Somalia, called AMISOM. That started with the Ugandans and the Burundians carrying the, the bulk of the, the burden, and they actually put their boots on the ground in Mogadishu, fighting back against al-Shabaab, trying to give the, the, what we recognize as the Somali government some breathing room so they could hold on and eventually push back al-Shabaab and retake the country. Um, and so a lot of credit goes to those soldiers from those other countries that came in and shed their blood um, trying to just hold a bad situation in check for a little bit. Um, what did the U.S. have to do with that? We supported it with a lot of our indirect resources. So bilaterally, we set up a, an elaborate multi-year program where we went in and helped train peacekeepers, where we did training, we gave them equipment, with the idea being that when they crossed that border from Uganda into Somalia, or they flew in from Burundi, that they would be as well prepared as possible to be effective peacekeepers and to keep that going. We also put a lot of effort into working multilaterally with the countries of East Africa, trying to teach them to you know, work together, to cooperate, to integrate, so that when they all end up together side by side in Somalia, they can do it effectively. And that's a, a big part of what the U.S. effort was, was to work through our partners to make them effective. Um, what did the effect look like? It's pretty dramatic. Again, I love the map, so we'll, we'll deviate here for a second. On the left, January 2014, the red is al-Shabaab territory. Almost nothing outside of Mogadishu was controlled by the transitional government in Somalia. Less than a year later, with the, once the involvement included Ethiopia and Kenya, they sort of joined into the Amisom effort, um, the, the coalition of countries from East Africa pushed back al-Shabaab largely out of all the urban areas, um, all the cities, into the, the rural areas, the, the the, the safe havens out in the, the hinterland. Um, and that's largely the way it stayed up until now. But it gave that civil society, the government of Somalia, some breathing room. With that much room under their control, they could train their army. They could develop the economy. They could get civil society involved again. They could bring back the diaspora and all of its intellectual and, and financial capital to help rebuild the country. 
And then hopefully they're now on the path of moving that forward step by step. It's not an easy path, right? You still see reports, you know, one, one week you'll see a news report about uh, a new youth organization mobilizing and doing great things, and the next week it'll be a car bomb that kills 100 people. And so it's a step forward and a step back, but at least it's giving that opportunity for some actual development to take place um, and the uh, instability to be held in check for a little while. And again, largely because of this strategy of combining our partners on the ground who combine to face a real threat to their neighborhood and them putting skin in the game and us being able to support them the ways we could. So, you turn to the last area that is probably more in the news these days when you talk about the Red Sea region, the big question of what we are going to do, what is the right strategy concerning Yemen? Trying to describe Yemen in about the next 10 minutes that I think I have on this is kind of like telling someone, summarize the whole series of Game of Thrones, don't leave out any important characters or my favorite episode. It is very complex. It is complex in ways that most other conflicts can only uh, be thankful they don't include. The religious aspects, the traditional society, interrelations between families, clans, all of that, the economic assets and aspects of it, as well as the humanitarian challenges, right? The, the uh, cycles of famine and economic collapse feeding into security problems make this a very tough one to crack. Um, what we can do is, again, we start with a map to sort of orient everybody on it. What's interesting is the map you get may show different things, right? Highlight different aspects of this conflict because it is so complex. Uh, today, the map on the left shows what most people would, would normally think of as the, the center of the conflict. We've got the Houthi group that started up in northern Yemen and for a large period of time was uh, simply a, a a region of the country seeking more influence, more access to financial resources of the state, more autonomy, um, you know, a, a piece of the pie. Um, over the course of the last 10 years, it has gotten more aggressive, its demands have increased, and it's expanded at the territory that it controls to what you see here now. Um, at the same time, groups from outside Yemen have arrived, so Al-Qaeda, uh, be, had a presence in Yemen back in the 1990s and has continued to, and it's growing still. Uh, the area on the, on the right, the sort of purple-shaded area, shows where one group considers their strongholds to be. And so it's not as simple as north versus south or Sunni versus Shia. You have, in the south, a largely a Sunni population. However, you've got al-Qaeda intermixed with it, so it's got presence in some places. We'll talk some more about what each of these players stand for and what their objectives are. But that kind of orients you on the, the map of where things are in play right now. Um, so who are these players that come in? Um, you'll often hear it referred to as the government. There is a government that is the one that is recognized. Uh, President Hadi is the accepted head of that government, even though he currently resides in Saudi Arabia. He's the one that took over power from the previous president during the Arab Spring. He was the vice president. He was seen as kind of a compromise person who could move forward after the uprising. Um, he took over and has been the president since then. However, he controls very little of the country, uh, the useful resources and things like that, um, and is trying to build that coalition of support in the South to stand up against the Houthis. Um, part of his coalition sometimes is a southern confederacy, a coalition of, of other politicians based in the south who don't necessarily agree with Hadi on his view of what's going on, definitely don't agree with the Houthis, although sometimes they've been partners in opposition to the central government. Um, currently, they're sort of half in and half out of a, of a coalition against the Houthis. Um, the Houthis, as I mentioned, began as sort of a separatist movement and it's now expanded to the south. They control the cap they've controlled the capital now for five years, um, control a lot of the resources, control some, a port on the western side there. Um, so a serious claimant to, to power. 
Um, and then scattered in, the, in, in among this group, you've got groups from Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. And basically, all of them are at some point or another fighting against each other. Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State obviously are, are not the same group, have been opposed to each other's solution set. And each of them fights against the Houthis and against the Southerners and against the recognized government. Um, international players have entered into it. Iran as a growing sponsor of the Houthis. The United Emir Arab Emirates, largely in support of the Southern uh, politicians. And the Saudi Arabians supporting President Hadi and that force ever since the transition back in at the end of the uh, Arab Spring. So international powers, the U.S. generally supports the Saudis, although often reluctantly, uh, differing on the approach, the tactics to be used, and you know how much firepower to put into it, and, and when to rely on other means to go forward. Um, so that's kind of the players. The, the U.S. has largely, you know, its active role has been limited to airstrikes. What makes this different from Somalia, for example? is that we're in Somalia, we didn't use airstrikes for a lot of that period of time. In Yemen, we've been using airstrikes consistently for the last decade. Uh, it actually peaked once in 2012 under the Obama administration, uh, or Bush and then into the Obama administration continued high. Um, in Obama in 2012, declined, and then it's back on the rise again. Now it's at the highest levels it's been in in, in a number of years. Uh, consistently using that as the one tool that we could use to strike, particularly against Al-Qaeda uh, locations within, within Yemen. So where do we go with this complex soup of conflicts and overlapping interests and things like that? Where do you start? Uh, one approach that I'll offer just as kind of a baseline from which you can discuss ways to amend it, deviate, improve it would be Many commentators will say, go back to what we talked about at the beginning of this presentation. What are our interests? Do we have an interest in who governs Yemen on its own sake? Probably not very strong. Our interest is economic, security, humanitarian would be the third one. If you start from that, then the question is, what about a dream of a uniting Yemen again under whatever coalition it takes? That our interest is not really the nature of that future state, it is simply having a state that functions. It could be uh, a confederation where the Houthis have significant power, the Southerners have power, everybody has some kind of government that can provide security, allow development to proceed, and from most people, most countries' opinion, keep Al-Qaeda and, and the Islamic State out, or at least at a minimum level of threat. In a perfect world, you could offer that proposition to Iran and Saudi Arabia, the UAE, the United States, and say, would that be okay with you if you could get to that point of a peaceful state solution in Yemen? They might say, works for us, right? Nobody wants to spend year after year shipping weapons, doing strikes, um, fighting a battle that's never going to end. And most Yemenis would probably say, you're going to let me stay in my place and build my life again and not have to worry about being attacked by drones or artillery fire from another part of the country? Sure, I'll take it. The trick is how do you get there? What mix of diplomacy and development and defense resources get you to that ideal state? And that's the rub is nobody has yet come up with a persuasive solution that allows you to, to achieve what most people would say is a reasonable goal. There are too many factors, too many ways to play the game. As a political scientist, you think of things like game theory that talk about how negotiations proceed. So right now, if you had four of the five big players all ready to sign an agreement, that fifth player that hasn't yet agreed holds the cards. And they're going to ask for the maximum level of seats at the table in the, in the cabinet. They're going to ask for the biggest share of resources left to get them to agree to come, come back and join. And so no one ever makes that last deal that would, that would move things forward. Um, it's a hard situation. And the longer it goes, the more extreme the positions get. 
right? We know from studying revolutions in other places that moderates end up getting thrown out and the radicals are the ones that keep getting the fire going and keep the, the conflict, you know, in place, getting deeper, more entrenched and prolonged. And so how do you get past that? I'm going to leave that right now as a question we can stew on for a little bit, and maybe talk about in Q&A if we want to think about how we would get past this roadblock. Um, the one thing I wanted to close with was what have we learned? I'm sorry. Sorry, backward here. A little bit on drones. When you talk about what the U.S. does, this is a map that sort of helps you get a little picture of how, how we do this, what this looks like on the ground, that we have these bases in the UAE, Camp Lamonia in Djibouti, from which we can fly drones and do the, the air operations that we choose to do. Um, these bases are very important. As we found out with Somalia, having a, a U.S. base there in Djibouti makes a big difference in what you can do. Um, on the right there, the five, $15 million reward is for um, uh, an Iranian official. Um, the story of this one was that at the same, on the same day where Soleimani was killed in Baghdad by U.S. attack, a rather sus suspicious incident happened in Yemen where this individual, Shalavi, was threatened apparently targeted by a strike of unknown origin. However, it was unsuccessful, so you didn't read about that one in the headlines the next day. Um, but it reminds a reminder that the U.S. is continuing to use this form of the foreign policy to try to affect the area on the ground, in this case going after Iranian support for the Houthis. Um, at the same time, only now a couple of weeks ago, the U.S. did a different strike and took out the leader of al-Qaeda in Yemen, uh, with a, a, a strike that was successful. So this is continuing as a tool of the foreign policy the U.S. practices within Yemen. Finally, just to summarize a little bit of, of this and to provide a glimpse of kind of where this might go. Uh, four things have been the pillars of our activities within the Red Sea for the last 20 years, um, all of which are subject to change. And where the future goes may depend on how events transpire and how the trend shapes up. One has been these forward bases. So particularly in the area we're talking about in Djibouti, we've, got a, we've had a base since soon after 9-11 that used as a base for the counter piracy operations. We've been using it to help provide forces to do some of those operations in Somalia, to work with the Ugandans, Kenyans, and Ethiopians, and now as a drone base for operations in Yemen. Bases have been critical. Bases have weaknesses, too. You know, a smaller base in Kenya was just attacked a few months ago with Americans killed. Um, a, a base can be a target as well as an asset. And we're not the only ones who can build bases. A big concern right now, I know China's role in Africa is often a topic, and I think there may even be a, an event that you'll have later in this series talking about it. The Chinese are actively building a base in Djibouti, not from, far from where the American base is, trying to get that same advantage that we've enjoyed. Physical presence, even if it's small, could be important. The fact that we had uh, a battalion of infantry and a battalion of civil affairs in Djibouti gave us a resource that we could use throughout East Africa and do operations there. Will that continue? That's a policy question that we in the United States have to answer. Right now, there's a lot of discussion in D.C. about pulling troops out of Africa, having fewer people on the ground representing the U.S. in the military side of things there. That would be a, a way to redirect attention out to the peer competitors uh, in China and Russia. So there's a lot of discussion about that, but there's also a discussion that says that'd be a mistake. And so part of what came out in the past week was that the, the army is actually shifting a different force to go support these activities in Africa, but a, a special group designed to do advising and assisting of security forces. So not combat forces, but advisory forces being dedicated there. Technology has always been a big advantage that we've used throughout the Red Sea region, as we've talked about. Is that going to continue to be our comparative advantage? This is a, a screenshot, sc screenshot of a Pentagon briefing last week talking about the seizure of an Iranian ship and its cargo uh, a couple of months earlier. 
now that they've had a chance to, to take a look at everything that was inside. Um, shipment of weapons going to the Houthis. So it's great that we have our drones and our other assets there, but when the Houthis start having ballistic missiles and surface-to-air missiles coming from Iran, that could shift that balance of technology significantly. They can attack ships out in the Red Sea if they have the right weapons. What does that do to our interests and our advantage technologically? Even on the low-tech side of things, it doesn't take a ballistic missile to counter American technology. Sometimes you just have to change your own strategy. So if Al-Shabaab finds that it's too easy to be attacked when they're out in the villages in the far corners of Somalia, maybe they reverse their tactics and they go back into the cities where it's harder to hit them and negate the advantage that the Americans have. Um, that's one of their options. It's always a cat and mouse game, uh, trying to see who has the advantage. And finally, the role of partners, right? In Somalia, in uh, both with the piracy and with al-Shabaab, we couldn't have had the success we did without relying on partners who are also willing to get involved. In Yemen, we've had more trouble finding that magic coalition of willing and able partners to do it. And what will that look like in the future? Can we build that coalition that we need to achieve that goal that I was talking about? Well. One of the interesting dynamics is that relationship. We have a relationship with Iran. The Saudis have a relationship with Iran. We have a relationship with the Saudis. Each one of those relationships has seen conflicts and opportunities over the last five to 10 years. Places when your interests might coincide, places where they're in opposition. How do you come to some kind of an agreement on the future of Yemen if that's the partnership that's, that's essential, the, the agreement you have to reach? Um, also in, in Africa, we've been asking a lot of our partners there, will they stay in the game, right? If, if the security of Somalia still depends to some degree on Amazon being there to support the government of Somalia, what happens if Uganda or Kenya or Burundi decide it's time to go home and focus on their own problems and not keep their forces there? What happens to Amazon then? All those are questions, and there's probably things out there that are other things that could change. New advantages that we might try to achieve, new challenges we'll have to face. That's what I had in the can. That opens it up to you. I know we have a lot of interesting experiences out among the audience, so feel free to share your perspective on it and, and bring some questions on. And I should say, there are lots of other very interesting countries and dynamics, so just because Eritrea is the one thing that you want to put on the table and I didn't talk about it, that doesn't mean we can't talk about it now. Uh, first and foremost, let's, uh, let's give uh, Dr. Dalmo uh, a round of applause for this thoughtful Thank conversation. You. I already see a couple of hands up in the audience, but as I'm walking around, uh, just a quick shout out, there's the number, text your question to 616-308-6560. I have uh, one text question to get us started from Davenport University. Is cybersecurity an existing or growing concern in the region? I think cybersecurity it's, you know, the, is, is a, it's a concern everywhere. I don't uh, know that it's unique concern to, to this particular region. Um, I think every one of the actors that we talked about will try to use cybersecurity to their own advantage. Um, clearly, uh, Al-Qaeda is no stranger to, to that area, and the fact that Iran is on the opposite side of the conflict in Yemen opens up the uh, connection to the cyber activities that they might pursue. Um, to the best of my knowledge, I can't think of any time where I've heard about specific use of cybersecurity being um, a, a unique issue within one of the conflicts going on right now in the Red Sea region, although it's, it's probably just a waiting for its time to be seen. Hello, my name is Hank, and I was stationed in Massawa, Eritrea in the late 50s. Awesome. A lot, yes. <laughs> a lot has changed since then. Great. Yeah, there's a, there's a great book. I, uh, if you want to know more about Eritrea, it's a fascinating case study going back to the Cold War role that it had. Um, and I'd, I'd recommend a book called uh, I Didn't Do It For You 
which is basically a history of how the other powers have been involved in Eritrea uh, since the early part of the 20th century. And it was never about helping the Eritreans. It was usually about state interests, whether it was the Italians, the British, the Americans, or, or some other power involved. So it's a, a pleasure to meet someone who actually had experience as part of that history. Wow, I've gotten about, oh seven or eight questions, so we'll just uh, try and, and do what we can. Um, first one, because you talked about this last night, what difficulties emerged due to U.S. commands, AFRICOM and CENTCOM, splitting the security of the Red Sea on each coast instead of one command? That is a great question. I love it. Um, so, yes, yeah, so just to sort of back up for people that haven't been following that, uh, for, for decades, the map of how the Pentagon divides up the world had European command, which included almost all of Africa, because when it started, they were still seen as kind of coming out of the colonial period, and Europeans still kind of had the lead in a lot of, you know, the parts of Africa that they'd formerly colonized. Um, and then you had Central Command, which has the Middle East as we normally think of it, the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and Pacific Command, which has a lot of that water space out there to the east of, of Africa. And I'm trying to remember exactly when it happened, 2009 or so was when the decision was made that to actually have a, a, a comprehensive and effective U.S. security strategies toward Africa, we needed to give Africa its own command. So AFRICOM, based in uh, Stuttgart, Germany, was created. Um, and so it is now the, the lead military command for all of the Defense Department's activities that go on there. However, anytime you do something like that, you have to draw, the ma draw a line somewhere, right? That somewhere there's a boundary between each of those commands. And so, um, and, and the lines actually do move occasionally. They shift one way or the other. So in the case of East Africa, AFRICOM's jurisdiction, if you will, ends at the waterline. And so, for all, at least historically, when they first stood up the command, all of that water off the shore was seen as either central command, because it was so closely connected to the Persian Gulf, all the activities that we were doing there, um, going back to the 90s against Iraq, our concerns about Iran's control of, of the areas close to the shore, or they were going off into the Indian Ocean. And Pacific Command is much more of a maritime-focused uh, combatant command, and so it kind of said it all just, it's one big ocean, right? So let's line it up that way. Being in Djibouti for the, the year that I was there, 2009 to 2010, it was often, it was a, a reality you had to deal with. Um, and it was, a, you know, it was very clear that Central Command was right off the shore there, but eventually you, you work it out. And the military is actually very good about working across these seams and making things things cooperate that way. Um, that is actually one of the other topics that's come up, though, within policy circles, is do you need to still have an Africa command? Um, what advantage does it give you? Uh, I, I personally am an advocate. I think it's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of advantages to having a command focused on the concerns of Africa. But it does create some interesting interactions. Um, and as you see, you know, because the line also runs down the Red Sea, where Yemen is in central commands, area of operations, and the Horn of Africa is in AFRICOMS, uh, you have to have a lot of tight coordination to make sure that no one's stepping on each other's toes. We've yep. got a couple of questions on China. Uh, could you elaborate <laughs> on the concerns the U.S. should have with reference to the recent Chinese military presence, as well as the Russian commitment uh, for the establishment of a military base in the region? Yeah, so that's, um, that's an area of concern. Um, I think in large part, it's, uh, I'd say hypothetical, not in the sense not to make it um, less of a concern, but to say that we haven't actually seen physical manifestations of it yet. But it's a, a future concern to develop is that um, if an, another country is invested heavily in a country in Africa, to the extent that the, the African country loses a degree of autonomy and independence and is then held uh, uh, 
to some degree compliant to China or Russia or another country. And that's where our, our concern gets in. So, for example, if, uh, if China becomes an important partner in Djibouti and controls port facilities or something like that, what influence would they have on the government of Djibouti? And could there be a point where at some, some point in the future they say, it's either us or the Americans, uh, one of us gets to keep the base, and you know who holds the, the, the lease on the important sites that you guys value. Uh, you know, do us a favor, tell the Americans to go down the road. That's the hypothetical concern, is that you get into a, a, a contest of influence over who's a better partner. So a lot of the discussion you have within the you know, Defense Department circles is, how do we remain the partner of choice? So even if the Chinese or Russians or others have investments, how do you make sure that the governments view the United States as the partner that they'll side with when, you know, if they, if they ever have to make a choice? And just as a follow-up, uh, how much has Russia become a major player in the Red Sea? We, we know that they're involved in Syria, but, uh, you know, are they yeah. everywhere? Yeah, I think my impression is that the Russian presence is not significant. I think that this may be a sign of wisdom as much as anything else, that not getting involved in a, in a fight that nobody else is winning by being involved. Uh, there are other areas of Africa where the Russians have established more of a presence, I think. Um, but in this particular area, they're so far have been a relatively minor player. I've, I've got a ton of questions. I'm going to do one, and then I'll come over to this gentleman over here. This is from Northern Michigan University. During your time in Djibouti, how was your relationship with the locals as an American? With the locals? Um, it, the Djiboutians are, were a great host to the American presence there. Um, you know, we were obviously bringing in a fair amount of, of money and, you know, buying local products and things like that and providing security to them. Um, relations were generally very good. Uh, one of the great things about sometimes when you're deployed in a situation like that is you actually do get out and get a chance to interact. And so uh, from the base, they would be uh, regular trips out to have discussion groups with youth there in Djibouti City. Um, and they were all very interested in talking to Americans and interacting. Um, they, as, as individuals, I think they see a lot of value in that, that connection. Um, I should say we also had great relations with the French, who also continue to have a presence in their former colony there in Djibouti. And we actively partnered with them to discuss how we can help the Djiboutians and how we can help other countries in East Africa, because sometimes the French could do things that we couldn't do and vice versa. And so another case of, of effective partnership out there in the region. Sir. Yes, regarding uh, Yemen, you talked about some of the possibilities and difficulties of getting a coalition uh, government as, as a solution. Is there any thought of having a separation? It, Yemen hasn't been united as a country for all that many years. Um, and given the extreme ethnic, religious uh, differences there, uh, what would be the problems and possibilities of having uh, separation again? Yeah. That's a great question, and, and that does come up. Um, a, a big hurdle to that is that if you have some kind of a regional con like a confederation or something like that, then you have a chance to sort of mitigate some of the challenges that a small state would have. You know, uh, they don't have that many good ports necessarily that are, uh, give them access to the, the ocean or to the sea. Um, they have oil in a particular part of the country. Uh, parts are good for agriculture, other parts aren't. And if you start to try, try to draw a map that divides up the country in an equitable and a, a, you know, a, play, a, a way that everyone would agree to, you have to make zero-sum choices about who gets the oil wells, who gets the port, who gets that kind of thing. And that becomes hard. I think that's why people would generally think that some kind of a, a looser organization within a single government would give you the opportunities to keep access to the, the ports, keep sharing some of the oil wealth and things like that, and it, use that to kind of draw in uh, participation in the, in the, in the regime. Um, 
drawing hard lines and making different states would be really difficult to get agreement on. So many good questions. We're going to try and do a few more before we close. Um, perhaps you could talk a little bit about uh, Somalia and how the neighboring countries, I mean, what, are, what is the relationship within Africa uh, when we look at, you know, the major players and, and how they're responding to mm -hmm. each other? Yeah, it's an interesting relationship there. Um, and so the countries that are involved, and I'm emphasizing the, the major East African countries that have participated in AMISOM as just the focal point, is that they're clearly doing it out of their strategic calculus as well, right? They're not simply doing it because they're humanitarians and they wanted to stop suffering and chaos in Somalia. And so the boundaries and the overlap of interests are so strong that they have an interest in seeing a stable Somalia, right? There's everything from the refugees that are caused when things in a neighboring country are, are not working well. You've got the overflow of violent actors. You know, the fact that Al-Shabaab, by his very presence in Somalia, poses a threat to Kenya in particular, but they've also done attacks in other East African countries. Um, they want to preserve their own interests first, security, economic development, and all the other things that, that a country is trying to achieve. However, they, they've taken the long-term approach and realized that they're going to get there by having Somalia be strong enough to take care of its interests. Nobody wants to annex Somalia or take over its territory that I'm aware of. Um, they want to just see it able to hold its own and be a, a, a partner within the region. And so they're doing what they've done with that reasonable goal in mind of, of trying to develop that relationship. Um, that's, and and they, they do have a, a certain amount of common identity and reliance on each other uh, that they would like to, to build on and, and create stability and prosperity for everybody. I'm going to try and give a couple of related questions. Uh, one person asked, uh, can you, you've talked a little bit about the goals of the U.S. and the region. What would you say is the main goal uh, between open shipping lanes, um, curtailing Iran, humanitarian, larger security issues? Sure. I mean, what's, what's the most important? And then related, yep. um, can you tell us a little bit about the U.S.-Saudi relations within our actions in Yemen? And then finally, this is a Ferris State University student who is questions about Iran and whether or not they'll have a larger presence in the Red Sea in the future. Yeah. Um, so the, the last two are kind of related, so I'll, I can save those for next. Um, the, f and now I've forgotten the first one, sorry. What was that again, Eric? What, yeah. what is the major, major, major interest, reason? Right, yeah. So it all depends, right? It depends who you're asking. You know, what, uh, it's in the eye of the beholder, right? Uh, in the security establishment, clearly the, the impact that instability in the region can have on areas outside of the Red Sea is our first security interest, right? So, and if you assume that that, that political perspective is what drives most U.S. foreign policy, the, the, the first and primary thing is respect for our national defense, our national security. Uh, we don't want another 9-11. And to the extent that having Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State able to have bases in a country without being checked by um, any local enforcement or a stable government, that allows them to get ready for the next 9-11. And so if you want to pin the one thing that we are going to try to avoid with our foreign policy in the region, that would be it. Of course, economics and the humanitarian parts are the most important thing for other people and for a lot of other interests. But I think from within the foreign policy establishment, the, the, the discussion always begins with trying to keep that, the, the threat of international terrorism and that kind of thing uh, as far away as possible. As far as the, the Iranian and the Saudi relationships, um, that's evolving. And again, it's, it's the, a lot of bilateral relationships that go different directions. You know, for a while, we were probably you know, trying to hold the Saudis in check 
and have them not be overactive in Yemen and making things worse through military action. And over the, the last two years now, they're looking at us and our interaction with Iran saying, you know, who are you calling aggressive, right? Um, now they're concerned about whether we're on the wrong path um, in taking the lead in this. The Saudis are very concerned that with the flow of a long distance Iranian weapons, that the Houthis now have the ability to shoot missiles and rockets into Saudi Arabia, into the, toward the Gulf states even. And so that's a critical threat for them because now it's not just about allies in Yemen, it's about their own national defense. From the Iranian perspective, I think, to the extent that the Houthis become a, a, a dedicated partner of theirs and a client of theirs, that allows them to influence the dynamics in the region in, a, in new and interesting ways if you're an Iranian planner, right? If you've got an ally south of Saudi Arabia with heavy weapons and access to a port, that makes the Iranian threat and the Iranian presence in the region even that much more powerful, in need of respect, and um, uh, you give them a bigger stake at the table, right? More cards to play and uh, more resources to use. Mike, anything else? Um, some a question about uh, if you're interested in Somalia, what reading do you uh, recommend? Are there, are there uh, good resources out there to learn more about Somalia in oh, particular? Okay, good question. Um, I haven't read anything really new that tells you what's going on today in Somalia. Um, the one thing I would advocate for is if you think just about the perspective of the piracy issue, for example. In the West, we got a lot of the narrative featuring kind of the US focus, the top down, the, you know, Captain Phillips, great movie, you know, very interesting to show the American perception of how things work. I would say the important thing is, is what you wanna look for is the alternative perspective. So I'm a big believer in, you know, if you spent a lot of time looking at the top-down approach, looking at military activity and what politicians are doing, set those aside and find the other way to look at it. And so Jay Baradur wrote uh, the book on, um, you know, Pirates of Somalia, later made into a movie. And the, the virtue of it is that it, you know, he actually lives on the ground in Somalia and talks to the people who are on the pirate side. And, gets to know why they're becoming pirates. And, and so the, the best book is the one that I haven't read yet that gives me something new and a, a different perspective. And that's what I would encourage anybody that looks at this stuff to do is when you've heard a lot from one perspective, look at it from a different direction. I'm not saying partisan or political perspective, but look at it from a religious side or an economic side or the side of women in Somalia or youth or something like that, because they're gonna give you a whole different narrative from what you're gonna get from the other readings. And so there's a, a wealth of things that are out there, and I'd, I wouldn't presume to highlight one or the another of them. But it's a great question. Yeah. Let's thank Dr. Delzell yeah. for a nice uh, yeah. perspective. Interesting, thank informative. You. Thank you. Thanks, it's a Steve. pleasure. Thanks much. And uh, we will be back here a week from today. We're going to be joined by Marissa Ensor from Georgetown University. She's going to talk about green peace building uh, approach to climate change. And we expect you back here a week from today. Thanks for coming.